like Rod said, we, uh, we do expect to be interrupted because interrupted by the Holy Spirit because our plans, they're not His plans. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And honestly, like, He's really been dealing with me a lot on that. And I was talking to Blanche this morning. Um, just the fact that I typically put a lot of notes together because I want to hide behind my notes. You know, it's stuff that I've studied. It's stuff that I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that that um, no matter what comes out, if it's in here, you know, we're good to go. But the Holy Spirit, He's really been working on me a lot because as God moves, if you know Him and you know this Word and you're studying this Word, He's going to speak to you and speak through you and you do have to be cautious with that you've got to balance it out you have to make sure that if if he's telling you something that you do confirm it in the word and so the things that i'm bringing today they are confirmed in the word but i'm not going to be going off off of a bunch of notes today um so please bear with me if you would i would really appreciate it um and it's interesting that you started talking about that, Rod, and that, that he kind of mixes stuff up because the first part of what, uh, well, I had, I had a plan. Don't get me wrong. I had a plan in place this morning. But he did mix that plan up as well already. Thank you, Jesus. Um, so I don't even need the little bit that I put together for this part. This morning during worship, um, there are probably people in here that, that haven't experienced things like what we experienced this morning in worship. A lot of places don't have people that, that wave flags around or that raise their hands even, jump up and down. I jump up and down, I spin around, I, I, I do whatever I feel like doing at the time, you know? And some people, uh, I've heard so many people say, well, you can't do that in a in a congregation worship because it distracts people. Well, God's taking us to a different place. He's taking us to a new place, a place where we can be unbridled before Him, where we can truly come to Him just as we are. And I was sitting there just just thinking and worshiping, and, and I was so zoned into Him, and then I started thinking, well, what do, what do other people think? Well, it's been a while since I've thought what other people think in worship. Because frankly, I'm, I'm not thinking about you in worship. I'm just not. That's not why I'm here. I'm not here to think about you. I'm not here to look at you or, or any of that stuff. I'm here to worship Him. And He is the one that created us. He's worthy of our praise, the Word says. He's worthy of our worship. And how I worship is probably different than the way you worship. And that how somebody else worships... It's probably different than the way you worship, and that's okay. If, if anyone starts to get distracted by those things, I just recommend that you just close your eyes and you ask God and you ask the Holy Spirit to help you to focus back on Him because He's what really matters. If the things going on around you are distracting, just close your eyes. I close my eyes a lot of times anyway, and then I start singing words that aren't really even up here. You know what I mean? I'm like, I sing my own song to Him. But, but the point is, is we're here to worship Him. And God, is, as soon as He started working on me in that, He, he brought up um, some scripture to me. So if you would, if you have your Bible, please turn in it. If you just have your iPhone or iPad or, or some other lesser quality product, um, then turn to 2 Samuel six twenty two. Well, 2 Samuel chapter 6 anyway. I'm just going to hit on this real quick because it kind of brings the point home of what I'm talking about. I'm going to paraphrase the story. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 6. This is King David. You all have heard me talk about King David before. He's the most mighty warrior to ever live. He was a small, ruddy dude that told a giant that was defying the armies of Israel 
that he was going to kill him. Not only was he going to kill him, he was going to cut his head off. And what does he do? He knocks him out with a stone and takes Goliath's sword, chops his head off, and he's walking around with it. Pretty stinking cool, but that's the guy that we're talking about here, okay? I'm setting the stage for you. That's the guy we're talking about. This man. Years later, it ends us up in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And the Ark of the Covenant, this, this structure that, that housed the presence of the Lord, had been stolen, had been taken from the Israelites. David finds out that it's over in Obed-Edom's house. He goes over to Obed-Edom's house, gets it, and, and he's bringing it back. As he's bringing it back, it is so important to him. The, the significance of what he's doing is so important to him that he has his people, all of them that are with him, stop every six steps. Stop. Sacrifice and worship. Every six steps on the way back with this thing. That's how important it was to him to honor God, to respect God. He's, he's worshiping God as he's coming back with the Ark of the Covenant. He's, the word says that he's wearing a linen ephod, which is clothing, that the, it's like a priestly clothing. He's coming back, and as he's coming back, he's worshiping. Now, this dude totally changed the face of worship. Before King David, worship was way different. It was so solemn, it was, it was quiet. King David just blows it up, man. Like, he turns it into a rock show. And... And he's dancing, and he's worshiping, and he's praising. He's praising his God, the God that created everything, in, in a completely unrestricted way, totally unrestricted, doing whatever he felt the Holy Spirit leading him and guiding him to do. That was way out of the norm for everybody. Well, as he's coming into the city, his wife, her name is Michael, and she's King Saul's daughter. At this point, David's the king. Saul's dead. Saul tried to kill him a bunch. Nevertheless, he went and got Michael back. And she's watching him enter the city with the Ark of the Covenant. And he's just in this linen ephod, just, just in it and nothing else. And he's dancing and praising and worshiping. And let me, let me read to you. It says, in chapter 6, verse 20, it says, And David returned to bless his household after he had already blessed all of Israel. He returns to bless his household. But Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, this is in a very snarky attitude, a very um, condescending attitude, how the king of Israel honored himself today uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants. As one of the vulgar fellows, James Leslie uncovers himself. And David, like, David's like, you're, you're coming against me for worshiping my God? Like, he wasn't naked. But he's, he's saying, you're, you're coming against me by the way that I'm worshiping my God? Really? Really? And David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above his house to appoint me as prince or king, ruler over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate before the Lord. And I will make myself yet more undignified than this. And I will abase in your eyes, but by the female servants whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. What you view as is not right and disrespectful, those females that you're talking about, they view it in honor. They view how I'm praising my God and worshiping Him in honor. That's how they see it. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. That's how that, that was followed up. It was, it was a, a blessing and an honor for women to have children, to bear children. But because she dishonored the king in the way that he was honoring God, she had to pay the sacrifice for it. She had to pay for that, and that meant that she wouldn't have children till the day that she died. 
Um, so I just, I want to encourage you guys. Be like David. Don't be like Michael. Don't be judging how someone else worships when you're not worshiping yourself. You know what I mean? Don't focus on that. Don't even think about it. Don't, don't look at it. Don't worry about it. Just worship your God. However God puts on your heart to worship Him. That's what He's calling us to do today. All right, so that's, that's what He interrupted me with. Now I'll get on with the rest of it. The end from the beginning. That's the title of the message. Becky contacted me, and again, I didn't have a message uh, title. I'm like, oh man, what am I going to call this? Um, but that came from a dream that I had Tuesday morning at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. on Tuesday morning, God wakes me up. Um, I'll get into that here in a minute. I'm going to read you a, a journal entry of mine. So I'm, I'm kind of letting you in a little bit closer than, than normal. But uh, in my journal entry, it said this. My time with God. My father God woke me up this morning at 3 a.m. to hang out with him. I had a worship song in my head, so I was, I was going to bring my phone in with me to listen to the worship song while I was hanging out with him, but he said to leave it. So I did. It was just me and him, just like it used to be, just the way I love it to be. I've drifted into being caught up in the busyness of life and have been lacking greatly in my personal one-on-one -on -one time with my Heavenly Father. This is the worst place I believe anyone can be, a place of complacency. It's simply lukewarm. However, I'm always amazed that you always meet me right where I am and gently turn my face back to you. You truly are my loving Heavenly Father. So, with that, I want to hit on a couple specific points. But first, I want to pray. Heavenly Father, you're such a good and mighty God. Thank you so much that you love us so much. Thank you so much that you choose to use all of us. You choose to find us in our brokenness and fix us and mend us and heal us and use us anyway, even though we are broken best. Thank you, God. that you are so good to us all the time. You are so very good to us. Lord, help us to receive from your word today. Help us to be sponges and just soak up your loving word for us. We pray these, th these things in the name of Jesus, Yeshua, the name above every other name. Amen. All right. So, one of the things I mentioned was complacency, and that's a very, very extremely dangerous place to be. Very dangerous place to be. Winston Churchill said in the early days of World War II, he said, I must drop one word of caution. Anybody know anything about Winston Churchill? The dude was, he was amazing, man. Like, his mind for battle and warfare was absolutely amazing. But God blessed him for such a time as that to save so many people. Winston Churchill says, I must drop one word of caution. For next to cowardice and treachery, overconfidence leading to neglect and slothfulness is the worst of all wartime crimes. overconfidence leading to neglect and then neglect leading to slothfulness, not doing anything, thinking that you're just fine where you are, not moving on in your relationship. He's talking about war. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about physical war because his country 
is entering into war against a massive superpower that, that seemed extremely daunting. I mean, the odds were definitely stacked against them. But I want you to think about this quote. I want you to think about it and the fact that we, every single day, you are in spiritual battle. We are in spiritual battle every single day. So, if we take this quote and we put it into the context of the fact that we are in spiritual battle every single day, then what is the worst of wartime crimes because we're in a war? What is the worst? It's overconfidence. It's thinking that you got it all together, that you don't need Him. And then you're neglecting taking that time to spend with Him, to get into the Word and to put on the full armor of God so that you can stand in the day of battle. And then that just leads to slothfulness. And that is the worst of wartime crimes because the reason that it's the worst of wartime crimes is because it's not only going to kill you, but you have a purpose and a plan for your life. That purpose and plan isn't just for you. It's for all the people around you. It's for all the people that God has ordained for you to impact your area of influence so that you can help them. But how are you going to help anybody else? How are you going to further the kingdom of God if you are neglecting spending time with Him and you're being slothful? You will be overtaken. You will be overtaken. I promise. That's just the way that it is. So then, if you noticed, I had mentioned the term lukewarm. Like God was, God was really hitting me. He's like, Nathan, you don't understand what's happening right now. You think that by being so busy, you're, you're helping yourself, you're helping your family, you're helping to, to, you know, make sure that everything's nice and comfy. But you're becoming lukewarm because it's taking away from your relationship with me because you're not spending the time with me that you used to spend. You're becoming lukewarm. That led me to Revelation 3, 15 through 17. If you have your Bible, please turn there. Revelations 3, 15 through 17. If you don't have your Bible, that's fine because I'm going to read it for you. John is penning this. Jesus is the one that's saying it. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Some translations say I will vomit you out of my mouth. He doesn't want it in there. You say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You can have all the things in the world and think that you're good. But you're not. You're not. That's what being lukewarm is. It is, it's... It's just being in that nice, comfortable place. You're like, man, things are going good. I got a good job. I got a good family. Everything seems to be going right. You know, my car hasn't broken down in forever. I don't need anything. I'm good, God. I'm, I'm good. I don't need anything. And he says, this, when you're in that place mentally, when you're in that place mentally, this is what God says about you. You think you have everything. And you say, I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He's not talking about physically. He's talking about when you think you've got it all together, spiritually, you're not there. And this life doesn't last forever. That's the whole point. It doesn't last forever, guys. This life here on earth doesn't. The other day, Brittany came up to me. 
And she said that she had a, a vision or a dream, I don't remember. Um, but she said that she was, I think you were praying for me or something. And she saw Jesus taking my face and turning it back to him. Taking my face in his hands and turning it back to him. Why it was turned away, I don't know. It shouldn't have been. But he's a loving father. And he gently turns my face back to him. And he gently turns your face back to him. Sorry, for those of you that don't know me, I typically don't cry when I'm up here. But, uh, yeah, I guess it's one of those days. So, before God woke me up, I had this worship song playing through my head, like I said, you know, and, and I woke up with the song literally playing in my head. And I love whenever that happens, because a lot of times I wake up with something really stupid in my head. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> this is ridiculous. But he takes me in to, uh, you know, he wakes me up and he says, hey, come hang out with me. And I'm like, sweet. Not that it was 3 a.m. That's not what I was saying sweet about, believe me. But what I've found is that when God wakes me up at 3 a.m., I'm bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and he sustains me throughout the rest of the day by his own power, by his own grace. And, and I know now he's done it enough that I don't need those other couple hours. Not that big of a deal. So I go into my prayer room, and, and uh, like I said, I don't even have a phone with me or anything. And I just get down on my knees in front of my chair, and, and I just start praying. And, and he said, just sit here. Just be quiet. Just sit here and be quiet. And I'm like, all right, cool. Have you ever found that whenever you come in front of God that you want to tell him all the stuff that you want him to fix for you? You're not alone. It happens to me too. But he just said, hey, just chill. Just be quiet for a little bit. But all right. So I'm sitting there, just hanging out. And it's quiet, peaceful, and I'm going, God, please don't let me fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he didn't. He didn't let me fall asleep. Because a few days earlier, I'd went skydiving with some friends of mine and my beautiful wife, Diane and Tracy, and some other friends that, that aren't here this morning. But we went skydiving, and, and uh, it's not the first time that I've went, um, but it has been like 18 or 19 years since the last time I went. And so we all did a, a tandem jump, like, where you got some dude strapped to your back or you're strapped to his chest, whichever you prefer. Um, and we got to, we got to go up 14,000 feet, which is, that's quite a ways. Most likely the only person in here that's jumped higher than that would be my brother, Steve, back in the back. Um, it's good to have you here, dude. Steve's one of my best friends. We work together. Um, but he used to do a lot of really cool stuff in the Marine Corps, and I won't get into it, but if you can think about it, he's probably done it. Um, but anyhow, we get in this King Air, and we're flying up 14,000 feet, and at that, at that height, you get to free fall for quite a ways, which is great. I mean, that's the best part, you know? And so we get up there, and... and we jump out, and it's, I mean, I just love it. My, my instructor, or the dude with me, he's telling me the different stuff, and I'm like, okay, cool, cool. And he's like, so you got everything? I said, yeah, but can we do flips out the door? And he goes, I didn't say we weren't going to do flips out the door. I'm like, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. And so we, uh, we jump out and, and, you know, just free falling, not 
not having to worry about a plane around you, you know, being able to see everything right there, you know, it's right there in front of you. It's, it's amazing. It's awesome. And so we're falling and, and he had already t- asked me if I wanted to pull the chute. I'm like, yeah, I want to pull the chute. Why wouldn't I want to? That's great. So I pull it. But the crazy thing is, is if you're not the one that pulls the chute, you don't know how much farther you fall before the chute catches. You know, but whenever you pull it and you're still falling, you're like, wait a second. Something didn't happen that should have happened, you know. <laughs> but then all of a sudden poof, it catches and, and we're floating and, and uh, I'm loving it, man. And he's like, hey, you see that little puffy over there to the left talking about a cloud? I'm like, yeah. He goes, you want to touch it? I said, yeah, I don't want to touch it. Who doesn't want to touch a cloud, you know? Have you ever been in a plane and you're flying and you see these clouds and you're like, man, I would love to be able to fly through a cloud without having a plane, you know? Uh, you, you've never said that, Steve, or you have? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I've always wanted to. And here's our chance, you know? He banks this thing hard and we're like flipping up like this. And I'm like, this is great. And as we're going to it, the sun is behind us. And we're coming into this cloud. Like, here it is, just rushing up in front of me. I can still see all the ground and everything. And I'm like, I'm getting to fly into a cloud without a plane. This is great. And I'm thinking, this is going to be cold. It's going to be wet. You know, whatever. But who cares? As we're approaching this thing, there's a rainbow. But it's not just a bow. It's a rain circle. You can see the whole thing. All of it. You can see all of it. And because the sun's behind me, And we're flying to it. There's a little shadow of me in the middle of the rainbow. I'm like, what the heck? This is awesome. I I mean, I've never even heard of anything like this. And I'm seeing this shadow in in this cloud, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as I'm getting up to it. And then all of a sudden, right through the middle of a rain, I got to fly through the middle of a rainbow. It was amazing. It was awesome. But, so whenever I get into this cloud, like all of a sudden, what I could see before, now I can't see. You can't see anything. Nothing. I knew I wasn't going to hit a tree because I was a little higher than that. But I'm like, I don't know. Maybe maybe Cheyenne's flipping around down through there. Maybe I'm going to slam into him. I don't know. All I knew is there was nothing I could do now. I'm in a cloud, baby. And then here before long, I'm back out of the cloud and we're sitting there spinning like crazy and I feel like my toes are going to pop off, you know, because we're going so fast. And I was like, this is so cool. But anyhow, we make it all the way down to the ground. And uh, I was like, I got to do this again. You know, who's, who's with me? Let's go. <laughs> you know, but, um, but what was interesting is as I'm, sitting there just quietly before God. He starts bringing this stuff back into my memory. And I was like, I started to, he started to speak to me through the circumstances, through the memories that I was having of the experiences that I had and speaking to me about himself and and what he wanted me to see through this. So he showed me, first of all, he shows me the rainbow, that it's the circle. And he said, have, have you ever seen the full circle of a rainbow from the ground? I'm like, no, never. I didn't even knew, I didn't know that it did this. And he's like, right, from the ground where you're at, you don't see it. But I see the whole thing. And I'm like, oh, all right, okay. And he says, a rainbow typically comes after the storm. And it's beautiful, but we can only see part of it. And we have to trust him that the other half of it is there. It is there, we just can't see it. But we have to trust him because we can't see it with our own physical eyes. That half of the rainbow is beautiful too. And then he's, he's showing me that even though a rainbow comes, after, typically after a storm that he carries us through that storm. Just like 
I was being carried along by that parachute by somebody else steering the thing for me. All I'm doing is hanging on, sitting there. I wasn't doing anything but enjoying the ride, enjoying the scenery, enjoying the wind and the breeze and, and just having a ball. Somebody else was doing all of it. And he's telling me, this is the same thing. Whenever you're coming up to, uh, up to a rainbow, you're getting to experience all this. I'm, I'm taking you there. I'm taking you there. I'm taking you through it. And he showed me that, that shadow of myself going right through what he can see is the whole, the whole picture. He showed me, as you're going through it, I've got you. I'm the one taking you through it. I want you to see that I'm taking you through it. I'm taking you through what I can see as the whole picture. And then he says, look whenever you, you went right into it. You went into something that you always wanted to do. You always wanted to go into a cloud. But what happened whenever you got in there? I couldn't see anything. He's like, right, exactly. But you were okay, right? You had to put all your faith and your trust and your hope in the fact that this parachute wasn't going to collapse. In the fact that the guy that's steering it knows what he's doing and he's going to get you right back out of where he took you. He purposefully took me there. God purposefully takes you into all different situations and circumstances in life. And, you know, before you get there, sometimes you can see everything. It looks great. But then whenever you get there, you're like, what is going on? I can't see anything. I have no control here, God. And he goes, yeah, I know. But I do. I know you can't see. You don't know what you're doing here. You don't know what's on the other side of this cloud. But I do. So trust me. And I'm like, wow, this is getting deep. But then he said... You know this cool experience that you just got to have, Nathan? I'm like, yeah, it was awesome. He said, you would have never got to experience this if you would have refused to jump out that door. You could have got up there. You could have had all the plans and intentions in your heart to get up there. But if you wouldn't have got up to the side of that thing and went out, you would have never experienced Getting to fly through a cloud. Getting to see the fullness of an actual rainbow, the way that I see it. You would have never experienced all that. When you get up to the door, jump out. If God's calling you, whatever your door is, if He's getting you there, jump out. You're going to experience things that, that will blow your mind. You're going to go through things that you would never get to experience otherwise. And he's wanting to show you how he's taking you through there. He's wanting you to trust that he's guiding you, that he's leading you through this stuff. And you don't have to know where you're going. It's okay. Just take that step. Jump out. Do it. Another big point that he was trying to to drive home to me is before I got there I didn't know the guy that I was getting strapped to I didn't know him I heard that he had 2700 jumps under his belt and about 1700 of those were with somebody else strapped to his chest so I figured he knew what he was doing right I mean you're like well he lived through that much He's told me some crazy stories about him almost not living through some stuff. I didn't tell my wife because I wanted her to be able to go too, you know. She loved it, fortunately. Don't tell her about any of that stuff. <laughs> but the thing is, I didn't know that dude. But he had a good resume. I got to talk to people that jumped with him. The guy was still alive. That says a lot, right? I mean, if you mess up there chances are you're not living through it, you know? But the guy's still alive. It's the same with Jesus. It's the same with Yeshua. He's the one that's, that we're getting strapped to. He's the one that whenever we jump out of that plane, you're strapped to him. 
the Word says that we are safe and secure in His arms. Isn't that amazing? We're safe and secure in His arms. We're strapped to Him, and we can trust the fact that He's led so many other people down the path. We can trust the testimony of so many other people that when He gets you there, He's going to take you through it. And pretty much everybody you talk to is going to say, Wow, yes, my experience with letting God lead me and guide me and direct me, even through the scariest of scary Coming out, I would never do it a different way. I would, every time I would do that. And that's how he is with us. That's how he is with us. You just got to trust that he knows what he's doing. The dude, he understood that I'm not quite the same as a lot of people. In my head, I, I like to live right there on the edge. Like, if I don't make it home, I'll miss you guys, but I'll see you soon. Kind of a thing, you know? Um, And whenever you let somebody else into that, somebody else that has the controls to be able to take you right up to the edge, you know, um, things can get a little wild. Like, right whenever we jumped out, you know, we're free-falling. I tell you how to do it and to put your feet back and stuff. This dude starts spinning us. Have you ever seen a merry-go-round? Anybody like all of you are probably old enough to remember the merry-go-rounds at school that your goal is to launch somebody off that thing, you know? Or maybe your goal is to hang on tight and not get launched off. I don't know. You, you're probably one or the other, right? Well, this dude, like, as he starts spinning us, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going to pass out. I'm, I'm going to pass out. I had to start doing the pilot breathing. The, you know, I'm like, I'm about to black. I'm going black. I'm going black. And then he, he stopped and spins us the other way. I'm like, oh, thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Boy, we were on the verge of almost too much for me. I mean, almost too much for me. But he knew right when to stop me. I don't know. It was I think he didn't want, like, throw up in his face or something, you know, because he's wearing this helmet. But I bet, I bet some of it would get up under there, you know. So he, he knew where to stop me. And it was, it, was, it was so much fun. If you haven't and you want to, I strongly recommend it. My Aunt Sarah and I, raise your hand, Aunt Sarah. We took my grandpa, her dad, when he was... Super old. Like he had to take his dentures out so they wouldn't go flying. <laughs> He's a wild child. But yeah, she calls me. She's like, hey, you want to go skydiving? I'm like, yeah. She's like, I'm going to take dad. I'm like, what? And he was one that always said, I'll never jump out of a perfectly good airplane. But then he finally got to a place in life where he's like, whatever. I'll do whatever. I don't care. And he did. It was so much fun. But he had to have been pushing 70 or above. And it was a blast. That was a super fun time, too. So, after a time like this, of being able to spend this time with God, just just quietly, I was just at, at so much peace. I was at so much peace because a lot of times when I'm trying to ask God what He wants to share, um, I can pretty easily pick something but if you can pick something that he tells you specifically it's it makes it just so much more peaceful and i just i just had to to praise him you know and i recommend that wherever you are in whatever situation that you're in whatever you're going through that you praise him he will give you peace We know that Morris is in the hospital, and I got to talk with Blanche this morning, and she's at an amazing place of peace. It just gives me hope. I'm I'm so proud of you. So proud of you. And uh, I do want us to remember to keep lifting Morris up in our prayers. But so where we are today, what this brings us to is The time of, do you know who he is? Is he real to you? 
Do you have a personal relationship with the one that can take you through anything, that knows where you're going, that's been there? He sees the whole picture. If you don't and you want to, I'm not ever, I told Rod and Scott this yesterday, I said, I will never, ever ask somebody again to, for, for everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes so that somebody won't get embarrassed whenever they give their heart to God. Because giving your heart, making a decision to follow Yeshua, Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, making a decision to follow Him is the best possible decision that anybody could ever make, ever, ever. The Word says that if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. But if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father. This path, this road, this life, this relationship with God, it's not one that's easy and it's certainly not for the faint of heart. Lots of people are going to hate you. They're going to want you dead, literally. It's not an easy path. But it's open for everybody. And if you want it, then boldly declare that you do want him to be your king. Boldly come before him. Boldly accept him. And we will pray for you, with you, and we will guide you through all of it. You know, the Great Commission says, to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say, when you enter into this relationship with me, Stay comfortable right where you are and don't let anybody know. It doesn't. It just doesn't. But you can't make a better decision ever. It's a wild life. But he's got you covered. So, if you do, if you don't know God and you want to, you want to have that relationship with him, boldly declare it. Um, whenever we're done here, we're going to play one more song. The lights will probably go down a little bit. It's going to be loud. But if you have made that decision that this is something that you want to do for the rest of your life, you're going to dedicate your life to it, then come up here and one of us will pray with you. We'll walk you through it, and then we will help make you disciples. That's what we do. That's what he's told us to do. That's what we do. I love you guys very much. I'm so glad to see you here. Hope you have an awesome day. And uh, let's go ahead with that music. <laughs>